Hello and welcome to BATV's coverage of the Masters of Cardiology under the theme Cardiovascular Care and Technologies in Low Resource Environments. Hi, I'm Javon Keyes and we're here to bring you the highlights. Stay tuned. So tell us what was the idea behind this weekend's conference? Well, a large part of our mission is education, education of not only our doctors internally, but our community doctors, because as we're fond of saying, you know, cardiology is a team sport. So if we know everything there is to know about the heart, but the people who are referring patients into us don't, then um, patients are not getting the best possible care or sometimes their care is being overlooked or symptoms are being missed. So we decided that having a conference, having a formalized approach to educating our community was in order. So for the Caribbean generally, is heart disease something that we should be particularly concerned about? Absolutely. I am fond of saying that if we put all other causes of death and disability in a box, so whether it be cancer or uh, HIV or murders or slip and fall, car accidents, if you put all those causes that Jamaicans and people in the Caribbean die in a box, and then you put cardiovascular diseases in another box, you would not be able to fill the cardiovascular disease box with all of those causes combined. So um, when we're talking about cardiovascular diseases, we usually include diabetes in there because the lion's share of diabetics die from heart disease. So heart disease, stroke, and heart attacks or cardiovascular disease as a bundle kill more Jamaicans than all other causes of death and disability combined. So we really all should care about it. You had some big names here. Tell us how that was and the reception that you've been getting from patrons about the kind of conversations that took place. We organized a conference under the theme Masters of Cardiology. And what we wanted to do was really to get absolute masters, people who are judged by their peers to be among the best of the best. And so we've got um, chairmen and division heads from major academic institutions in the U.S. We have the chairman of medicine from the University of Pennsylvania, the chief of cardiology from the University of Pennsylvania. We have the chairman of cardiology from UCLA, and the list goes on. It promises to be a very exciting conference. Uh, there's the le learning never stops. The, the moment you stop learning, you know, you're dead. Um, Dr. Pamasek has been a great leader in medicine uh, for many, many years. And uh, he graciously accepted our invitation uh, to headline this event uh, with the opening keynote lecture and I think that is going to be very, very revealing uh, because the, everything we're able to accomplish in medicine has to do with the leadership that drives it. Uh, but sometimes, you know, there are innate qualities in leadership and there are some things that we have to learn along the way uh, to accomplish that and i looking forward excitedly to hear that lecture and other lectures to follow. Jamaica is a very beautiful island. Um, it's one of the most beautiful places on earth, you know, so uh, some of you may not have time to explore the rest of Jamaica, but uh, this should be an ongoing series of conferences we're going to have. We're looking forward to robust collaborations with our you know, partners, you know, that are here. And I think uh, you will be hearing more of us. Uh, we'll be welcoming you all again here. So we developed a multi-pronged program. We hired professional coaches for every one of the people on the leadership team for one or two years. And we developed a 
we developed a model to focus on what they wanted to accomplish as an individual, where they felt their needs were. Now, I was skeptical, I got to tell you, about this professional coaching. I didn't know what these people did. But as, as a number of people have pointed out to me, even professional tennis players still have a coach. If you can get people that have these skills, and there are organizations that teach these people, we found these professional coaching properly directed incredibly important. We started with a, a full day immersion in terms of leadership and had uh, a plenary speaker on that subject with many exercises. Then over the course of two years, we had, and I want to stress, interactive sessions. These were not just lectures on how to have a difficult conversations. They were simulations. They were exercises. There was peer-peer -peer interactions in terms of getting people engaged. And we felt that this tripartite approach combined with readings, and I can again provide you with a list of the readings that we'd recommend, were what our faculty needed to develop their leadership skills. And again, this was our overall goal, to improve, move people to the right on that nine box, improve their learning agility, because this touched everything. And ultimately, if we were going to lead change, we needed people that were agile, that could function in multiple domains and not just focus on one trait. And this is when we looked at the nine box in terms of where our faculty started out. This is actually what it looked like. We had a number of people that, as you're facing it on the left, were really people that tended to focus on depth, going in depth to things. We had a few people that were actually focusing more on agility. Now, the truth of the matter is you don't want to be too far right or too far left. Some people are more detail-oriented, more focused-oriented. Some are more agile. But where you really want to be is somewhere balanced, somewhere in the middle. And so this was what our curriculum, curriculum looked like. Um, we first developed a cadre of coaches, and we did some matchmaking, knowing the skills of the coaches and the skills of our trainees. Um, we, we had each of the division chiefs and each of the um, vice chairs and, and division administrators do a personal via edge personality survey. And that tells you your own personal style. Now, I was skeptical about that. I took it myself. But I have to tell you, I learned more about myself with this little tool, and I think it was dead on than I really fully ever appreciated about myself. And we used that to inform the coaches. The only people that saw this were the coaches and the trainees in terms of what they should focus on in terms of the development of this leader in our department. And then we started the interactive sessions. Uh, we had a few rules. First of all, we wanted people to show up. Second of all, we said, what's said in this room stays in this room. We knew people needed to expose themselves, their vulnerabilities in terms of what they needed to learn, and tell people stories about what things they had done that had worked, and also things that they had done when they had failed. We wanted our division chiefs and vice chairs to bring examples of both. We wanted people to keep all their scheduled co coaching sessions. I think we insisted on about 10 hours of coaching over the course of a year. Uh, we said that nobody could send um, uh, substitutes. Um, and we basically invited our admin, division administrators to selected sessions, pr primarily focused on the business and finance of the department. I'm going to talk about resistant hypertension, new and emerging concepts. I'd like to thank Drs. Bao and Madhu and Ms. Lisa. They've done wonderful things organizing this particular conference. I bring you greetings from New Orleans, which is the most northern Caribbean city. <laughs> So I understand being a little bit behind in time. But I have a lot that I want to cover, and it's related to an area which I think is important not only in the United States, but also throughout the Caribbean, high rates of hypertension, high rates of poorly controlled hypertension. Here are data from the United States. So this is non-Hispanic white. This is non-Hispanic black. And over the last several decades, you see cardiovascular disease mortality has been coming down. But what you may note are two things. One is, if you take those data out to 2014, you see a plateau. It's starting to slow down in terms of the decrease in mortality. 
And some of the newer data are suggesting there may even be an uptick in cardiovascular mortality as we have increase in obesity, diabetes, poorly controlled hypertension. The other thing I want you to show is if you're looking at all cardiovascular disease, the top curve, the differences between blacks and whites in the United States, it's not even close. We're not talking about social science. This is dead bodies at the side of the road. Cardiovascular mortality comes earlier and higher in the black population when compared to the white population. Here are the rates of hypertension control. You can see we did well for several decades, but over the last several years, the rates of control are actually starting to decrease somewhat. Now, who has resistant hypertension, which is basically blood pressure that remains above goal despite being on three or more medications at maximally tolerated doses, and often that includes a calcium channel blocker, RAS blocking agent, and a diuretic. This is a paper that uh, I published two years ago, and one of the markers for resistant hypertension is black race. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is genetically driven. Some of it's related to dose disadvantaged status, health-seeking behavior, not having a primary source of care, and when the person presents to the hospital, the emergency room, the urgent clinic, they've already had years of poorly controlled hypertension. Living in the southeastern part of the United States, which is where much of the African diaspora came in to the United States, remains disadvantaged for resistant hypertension. Excessive salt intake and excessive alcohol intake. Alcohol raises the HDL. It has not been shown to be protective as we once thought, especially for men two or more drinks. A woman one or more drinks on a daily basis may actually cause an increase in hypertension. We take a break now, but we'll be right back with more from the Masters of Cardiology. Welcome back to Masters of Cardiology. Here's more. The Heart Institute of the Caribbean is the only one of its kind in the region, is it? Uh, that's correct, in the English-speaking Caribbean. And what kind of um, gap has it filled regarding the whole issue of cardiovascular diseases or um, issues in the region? Hopefully, we're trying to play a role in um, helping to address the rising epidemic of cardiovascular diseases in Jamaica and uh, specifically and in the Caribbean in general. So we, the Heart Institute of the Caribbean as the only freestanding cardiac center of excellence and the HIC Heart Hospital as the only heart hospital uh, in the English speaking Caribbean. Uh, we have provided a platform you know, for individuals with cardiovascular disease uh, to have one-stop shop where they can get um, acute treatment and uh, ongoing management of chronic cardiovascular conditions. And with that, there's no surprise that you would have had this conference, Masters of Cardiology, so tell us where that idea came from. Well, you know, one of the part of the mandate of the Heart Institute of the Caribbean is to uh, continue to inform and educate and continue to learn. Um, we believe that um, effective cardiovascular service delivery uh, has to be a coordinated team effort uh, to make sure that the various aspects of uh, uh, diagnosis, treatment, and ongoing management are properly covered. Um, it's impossible to deliver good cardiovascular care as a one man. It's not a one man sport, it's a team sport. You know, there are so many aspects of cardiology. One cardiologist cannot know everything, it's impossible. Uh, if you have any one cardiologist that tells you he can deal with everything, then I think you have to question the sincerity of that uh, um, claim. One cardiologist can also not be on call or available 24-7, 365 days. As you know, cardiovascular disease can be fatal and can be quickly fatal, and acute heart attacks can occur without warning. And so if you have a solo cardiologist, you know, running a center, then that will make it impossible. It puts patients' lives 
you know, at risk essentially because that person may not be available when the heart attack, you know, strikes. So that is the kind of information patients and doctors also may not be consciously aware of. And so intellectual exchanges you know, of best practices become very critical. And uh, the work we do uh, has, um, you know, uh, many ramifications. And uh, our expertise also informs our approach. Uh, we have uh, international collaborations. Our peers internationally recognize our competence and have respect for what we do as we do what they do, as we, the kind of respect we have for them. So it's shared values. So why does virtual care matter? And we're defining here virtual care as care in which the doctor is not actually putting their hands on the patient. They are either interacting with them over the phone or video or they're an expert who's reviewing a synthesis of that patient's records. Can virtual care really make a difference? Well, I would like to recognize Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In 1966, he was speaking at a press conference in Chicago, and he said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhuman. So the work that all of us are doing that brings us here today is not only helping a patient here and there, but it's doing the right thing. It's combating injustices, um, uh, injustice and inequality in access to medical care. What can virtual care accomplish? If I'm not here laying my hands on the patient, putting my stethoscope on the chest, can virtual care really make a difference? The answer is yes. So basically, Ashifa is a woman in her early 50s who had a lump in her neck and she was diagnosed with metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. And um, she came to uh, Best Doctors, which is the company I work for and has you know, subsequently been acquired by Teladoc Health, um, to have, you know, she lives in Calgary, but she wanted to have her case reviewed by top experts in head and neck cancer, top experts in pathology, to see if, if her treatment, her planned chemo radiation was the right thing to do. I had a lump on my neck and um, what happened was um, we got a biopsy done and it was negative. There, there were no issues. But my family doctor said, it doesn't belong there and let's get it removed. About 10 days after that, I got a call and it was my surgeon. The surgeon said, Ashifa, you need to clear your calendar. No appointments, nothing, clear it for a few months. This is not going to be a fun treatment. You are going to be living a nightmare. Ashifa's doctors were searching, doing multiple biopsies in her throat, her tongue, removing her tonsils to try to find where did that cancer originate? And they couldn't find it. The chemotherapy that's used to treat head and neck cancers is often um, use, uses what are called platinum-based agents, and those are, are very toxic. They're ones that cause a lot of side effects, a lot of nausea, are very difficult to go through. And then again, the radiation, instead of just having a focused field of radiation, they were really looking to irradiate a large area of Ashifa's head and neck, hoping to get the cancer wherever it originated because they couldn't find it. And somewhere throughout that, all of a sudden, it hit me. I've got a best doctor's policy and I need to contact them. At Best Doctors, we take very, very seriously the trust that people put in us. And we recognize that it is absolutely critical always to go to the primary source, always to use the primary data, because misdiagnosis can happen anywhere. So it's not enough to just take a pathology report on face value or a radiology report on face value. We always make sure to, to collect the primary data ourselves and have our experts review the pathology, have experts in the field reviewing the radiology scans because that is something that really enables people to feel very confident that misdiagnosis, if it's there, has been identified and that their diagnosis is accurate the treatment will be there to deliver optimal outcomes. Three days before the treatment was supposed to start, we got the magic call from Best Doctors. 
It said, no cancer. Multiple top pathologists all looking at her slides to confirm that um, in that lymph node there was no cancer, that the diagnosis of metastatic cancer was wrong. The end result is there was no cancer. There is no radiation. There is no chemo. And it's best doctors. It's everything that was done with best doctors. The entire team, just incredible. Best doctors saved my life. So, um, and what she, what, what Ashifa ends up, um, what she has is Sjogren's disease, which caused some very, very funny looking lymphocytes to be in her lymph node, but it was not cancer. So, but why did, why did Ernest um, invite me to speak here today? The reason is this, is that all of us are looking to improve the access of men and women and children to high quality medical care. And the potential of virtual care to be able to be a remarkable tool in this mission that we all are engaged in, is it's, it's remarkable. We're here today in Jamaica, and a lot of what we're talking about, I think the people that, as I sat down listening to all these talks, the folks at HIC have done a lot of these things already. And I think, you know, maybe looking at the model that you guys have implemented, I know You've probably gone through some rough and tumble period in building this because as my own experience is that it's not easy to, um, to, to accomplish what you've done. But I've had some unique experiences uh, in Nigeria. This is where you know, we need to look at sustainable options. Nigeria is a unique country with about 186 million people in 2016 expected to become the fourth largest country in the world uh, by 2050 uh, with about almost uh, 493 million people. And the GDP is 376 billion and is considered lower middle income. We've seen a similar graph for many low, uh, low middle income countries similar to this in the course of this talk where there's still a large percentage of the population that are young. And the healthcare system there is very fragmented, like as you see, there are 33,000 general hospitals, 20,000 primary care centers, and 59 teaching hospitals. But the healthcare is assessed by only 43% of the population. And that's a problem. And sometimes a lot of the drugs, they are substandard, they are imported from different parts of the world, some are manufactured locally. But so, my role was to work with Heart Rhythm Society. I currently serve as ambassador for the Heart Rhythm Society to Africa about how do we grow the practice of electrophysiology on the continent. And we started um, a few years ago just with some colleagues where you know, we first of all tried to define the magnitude of the need and, and some of the other things that um, that we may be able to do. But a lot of the services currently is limited to implantation of devices. Some of the barriers we saw was the issue of infrastructure and the cost to the patient, as I mentioned before, and the lack of trust in the medical system by the patients, and also the issue of the fear between primary care doctors and cardiologists. I had that being that they feel they lose the patients to the cardiologists. We face the same issue that primary care doctors were afraid to refer to the cardiologists. Even we face the same issue in the United States. It's the same issue everywhere that they look. But the key is to train people that keep that patient alive for us. That's how you can have a patient in the first place. Stay with us. We'll be right back after these messages. In case you're just joining us, we are at the Jamaica Pegasus for the Masters of Cardiology event. Stay tuned for more highlights. When I was a single surgeon here, I would have to do, treat cases, cardiac cases, general thoracic cases, and there comes a point in time in that when you are the only surgeon, what do you do in relation to getting or 
training other youngsters to take over from your position. Because of this limited resources, we planned over a number of years to introduce the program. And we finally, at the University of the West Indies, introduced the DM in cardiothoracic surgery, which involved training in the first three years the members of this program were exposed to general surgery. And within that three-year period, they had six months in cardiac surgery and six months in general thoracic surgery. Then they had the final three to five years were spent in being exposed purely to cardiac and general thoracic surgery. Now, of course, the opportunity to be exposed to these programs was limited by the number of patients that you operated on. And of course, the number of patients operated on was limited by the resources that were available to you. And fortunately, to increase the resources and the number of patients operated on, I was able to invite teams of surgeons teams of cardiologists to visit at certain periods of time. We would investigate the patients, and we would do these cases, thus increasing the number available to our trainees. But of course, we felt that the numbers were not significant enough in Jamaica, and we arranged with our colleagues for these youngsters to be trained in facilities in other countries. And fortunately, with this program, we have established the numbers of cardiothoracic surgeons in Jamaica now is approaching seven. And uh, I will then hand over to our other um, members of the panel, because their information would increase our, um, what we have available for our graduates. In terms of GME training or residency training or fellowship training in low or medium resource environments, it's all about partnership. Uh, but let me say from the outside that this is not a one-way partnership it goes in both directions. Um, at Penn Medicine, we have some experience uh, historically in starting a medical school in partnership with the University of Botswana. Uh, it's now in its seventh or eighth year. Um, and I would say approximately one quarter to one third of our medicine residents at Penn actually spend time in Bo Botswana getting a global health experience. And I'm absolutely convinced that we get as much out of this as we uh, as hopefully they're gaining from our interactions with them. We also send faculty members and have an on-site director in Botswana. The point is it's about a two-way partnership. We all can learn from each other. And I think that I'm very excited. Dr. Madhu has reached out to us about uh, an interaction in cardiology. I was talking to Dr. Coppola, our chief of cardiology, about, a, um, a, about sending both our trainees down here, uh, our faculty down here, but also bringing trainees from uh, Jamaica and the Heart Institute and the rest of Jamaica, for that matter, back to, um, uh, back to Penn for some training. So I'm Carol Watson. I run the Cardiology Fellowship at UCLA. And I can tell you, when I took over the fellowship five years ago, we sort of reimagined the whole thing. And one of the key principles we put in there was that the world is flat and cardiology is global. So one of the things that was never a part of our fellowship before was a global experience. Since then, we have a elective rotation in Malawi, and again, most of our internal medicine residents go to Malawi and now some of our cardiology fellowships. We have an ongoing collaboration in Malawi where when we first went over there, we got a grant to take over three echocardio echo machines. And with that, we were able to 
quadruple the number of echo machines they had in Malawi. So they now have four, and we have an ongoing collaboration where they send, st we trained physicians there to read echoes, and honestly, they read echoes better than some of our echocardiographers now, and they send studies back and forth, and so that's been a really fruitful collaboration. We also now have a, a, an elective with, in China, we have a, affiliated hospital that we send fellows back and forth with. We have a quarterly trans-Pacific CATH conference where we take turns. They present a case, we present a case. And it's so interesting hearing how similar the patients are and how similar the procedures are, but then also how different the approaches. And so many of the approaches make a lot more sense. So we're getting as much as they're getting, I agree with you. Making sure we can um, offer as much as we take is important. And I will be talking to Dr. Madhu about initiating a, some kind of partnership with his institution. Because again, what we take away and what we give, I think is so important to our trainees. And there is no way you can train a cardiovascular specialist for the future without understanding the global landscape. Uh, Walter Clare from Vanderbilt. And uh, actually, mine is more of a focus on the undergraduate medical educational aspects of uh, global health and, and under-resourced areas. So quite frankly, at, at Vanderbilt, we do not have formal active relationships in global health for our students. But we have a strong program in coordination with our um, program in public health that allows our students to have a global health experience. They do various exchanges. But in fact, at Vanderbilt, we find ourselves a well-resourced, highly technically oriented academic medical center in the midst of what we call the cardiovascular disease belt of the southeastern United States. And so to some large extent, our experience with uh, under-resourced areas has to do with working with the rural communities in not only Tennessee, but southern Kentucky and northern Alabama. And what we basically have done at the medical student level is to get our students involved in those types of activities, as well as our own uh, medical student clinic, which a lot of universities around the United States are doing now. Uh, a little bit of the uniqueness of ours is that we have a collaborative relationship with Meharry, one of our historically black uh, medical schools in Nashville, and we have what we call the Vanderbilt Meharry Alliance. So we do a lot of population health with them. Uh, but what I really want to talk to you about for a moment is the fact that um, we have indeed, with all due respect to what's going on at UPenn and leadership, been focused on this issue of leadership at the undergraduate medical level with our students. About a decade ago, we developed a program in health and wellness for our medical students. And uh, it started out primarily as a, an activity that involved extracurricular events. Uh, and then about eight years ago, it transitioned just about a year before I started working with the program to incorporating narrative writing, mindfulness, public policy, leadership and conflict management into a curriculum for all of our entering medical students. At Vanderbilt, we've divided our medical school into four colleges. Each of the four colleges has uh, a couple of mentors. I'm one of the two mentors for my college, Chapman College. And so when the medical students enter our school, they are assigned to a college. It's not at, strictly at random. And they stay in that college until they graduate. And that includes the MD, PhD students. So I have some students who've been with us seven years. And over the course of those seven years, we start out with that curriculum, which involves 43-hour sessions during their first year and multiple sessions throughout the remainder of their medical school curriculum. And we do almost everything that you saw in that slide about leadership development in some form or fashion with our students. It's really an introductory level for them. And it's interesting that I've served on um, visiting committees to a number of other medical schools, one in particular I visited recently. Um, and they have worked in collaboration with us to change their curriculum. 
And I was unpleasantly surprised to learn that much of the stuff on emotional intelligence and conflict management was not included in their curriculum. And when we evaluated them and we talked to their faculty about the problems they were having with the new change in their curriculum and the relationships that were not going well among their students as they worked in the classrooms, they admitted that they'd missed the ball on that and that in fact they had to abruptly stop the curriculum, put it uh, in recess for a bit, and go back and teach the students how to interact with each other. Because most of our medical students um, are in medical school because they have been highly successful individual learners. They have not necessarily learned how to, to work in teams, and that's where we find most of the conflict. We now take our final break, but please don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back to our coverage of the Masters of Cardiology event here at the Jamaica Pegasus. Here are more highlights. How did you feel when you got the invite to come to this conference? I think I was uh, very privileged and honored. Um, I was also, I think, just thrilled at the fact that a conference like this exists. I'm an academic cardiologist and I go to many conferences, I participate in many endeavors, but not all of them, I think, are you know, as uh, focused on issues which affect many of us, but not everyone rises to the, to the occasion to try to address it. For persons watching, what are some of the recommendations you may have to the average viewer about ensuring that they are up to date regarding their card cardiovascular health? So I think one of the important things is um, doctors are your friends, okay? Um, we talk about a healthy lifestyle and in general I think many people, maybe they are aware of it, but you know, I think a lot of people know about the importance of keeping their weight under control. If you have too much weight, you need to lose weight. Even if you are the right weight, everybody needs to exercise um, and again, diet, avoiding bad habits like smoking. So there are a lot of those things. But then to also know that there are diseases which can come on which you won't know. You don't know or feel when your blood pressure goes up. You don't know or feel when your blood sugar goes up, when your cholesterol goes up. So there are many things which um, are hard for you, know, you to know, but they can affect you long term. And so don't be afraid of doctors. I know that there are many thoughts about doctors, what they do, what will they do. But we've learned, especially I think in other countries, that preventing disease is the most powerful thing you can do. And as I've said, some of these are invisible things. So I think everyone should, as part of what they do, at least every one or two years in, in a healthy person, at least see your primary care doctor who can screen you. And if they you know, discover something that needs a cardiologist, you know, we're more you know, for people who have more disease, then you, you will get referred to us. But at least make sure you're seeing a primary care physician on a regular basis. So what was your discussion based on today? What was your topic? Uh, it was a lot of topics today about educational topic uh, and a uh, real problem and for uh, uh, training physicians here in Jamaica and uh, um, on other topics uh, about the healthcare system in uh, Jamaica and how to provide the best healthcare for all the patients in here. A lot of technical topics about the cardiology and uh, the advances, in, uh, the new advances in cardiology in the time being and how can we deliver and uh, uh, conduct this uh, advances to, uh, to Jamaica for the time being. What was your main takeaway from the event, the conference overall? Yes, sure. Those conferences we, we are making to provide a real impact on the society after that. So it's not kind of meeting people, it's kind of re-innovation of the system and the innovation of all the and revising how we are doing things. So today we had this opportunity to meet all the pioneers. This first time uh, that this conference happening in Jamaica and I hope that it will run every year to see all those uh, brilliant guys over there, uh, over here, uh, more time. So tell us your view on this conference. 
this was a very, very, very well run, very educational conference. I'm impressed by the lineup of, of um, the masters of cardiology, um, the wealth of experience they brought um, uh, to, to the meeting, and and then the overall focus on cardiology management in our setting, uh, our resource poor setting. Um, most of the um, presentations, even though we discussed. Um, fairly, you know, cutting edge topics, you know, everything was brought back around to how does it impact the Caribbean people. So I, I thought it was a very good conference. What was your topic or topics of focus? My topic was on women and heart disease um, and special considerations for Caribbean uh, women. And that discussion is important because we find that more women in the Caribbean are prone to heart related diseases. Is that correct? It is correct. So um, uh, ischemic heart disease is the number one cause of death in most of the countries of the Caribbean and even in uh, Jamaica, um, where diabetes is, um, is said to be the number one cause of death. They, that, that death is mediated through cardiovascular disease. Um, so one of the issues with um, women is, um, and, and, and not just women, but their providers, etc., and the public, uh, people tend to think about breast cancer and other gynecological cancers as being their number one problem. And yes, early on in um, the reproductive uh, years, that is an issue. But as you get older, cardiovascular disease takes over as the um, number one healthcare issue. And um, when, then when you look at a population as, as a whole, cardiovascular disease ends up being the leading cause of morbidity and mortality. So so um, when we talk about women and heart disease, it starts from education of the public, um, public perceptions on, on women's risk for, for heart disease, and trying to, to twist that in, in people's minds. Even in, in the primary care setting, a lot of primary care providers don't, don't consider cardiovascular disease risk when they're seeing their patients. They think about doing the pap smears and the, the mammograms and, and all of that, but um, especially as the woman starts to age in their late 40s, and 50s then they need to you know that conversation has to be had so tell us about the topic that you spoke on today today I talked about uh, sleep and cardiovascular disease and I like to think of it as the sleep or in heart disease because many people know of all the traditional risk factors for heart disease high blood pressure diabetes high cholesterol being active but not many people are aware how important it is to have enough sleep and also, that's number one. And secondly, that there are some sleep disorders, such as sleep breathing disorders, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, that can, if not treated, can cause other cardiovascular diseases. As it relates to heart treatment generally, and I'm sure you've probably looked at the Caribbean as a whole and some of the issues that may impact um, Caribbean citizens or black people generally, what are some of the recommendations you may have for the average citizen to take care of their cardiovascular health? Okay. The first thing I always like to say is definitely know your numbers. Uh, you need to know what your blood pressure is basics. If you go to the doctor, don't just leave, oh, I had a visit today with a doctor. What was your blood pressure? What was your weight? If the doctor didn't um, blood test, what are the results? What's my cholesterol? What's the good? What's the bad? Know all these numbers you, for yourself. Based on your weight, are you in line with what it should be? Are you overweight? So take uh, control of your health by knowing all these numbers first. So after you know your numbers, if any of the numbers are out of line, if your blood pressure is too high, definitely seek treatment right away. And a lot of times in the Caribbean, and I hear this often, people say, well, my blood pressure is controlled, so I don't need to take the medication. No, it is controlled because you're taking the medication, so you need to continue taking the medication. And I have problems with relatives of mine. I say, well, are you taking this? They say, well, the prescription ran out. Well, although it ran out, it means you need to continue taking it. So little things like this, I think it's very important. That concludes our coverage of the Masters of Cardiology event put on by the Heart Institute of the Caribbean in conjunction with the Association of Black Cardiologists. I'm Javon Keyes for Business Access TV, serious about business.